Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's program, All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen-Belsen with author Bernice Lerner. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all of the lands we are on. While we meet today on a virtual platform, please take a moment to consider the importance of the lands and waters that feed our body and our souls. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral land and the territories of all the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people who call this land home. Bernice, Bernice Lerner is the author of All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and The Liberation of Bergen-Belsen, and other writings on the Holocaust and virtue ethics. She is the former Dean of Adult Learning at Hebrew College, former lecturer on the Holocaust at Boston University, and a senior scholar at Boston University's Center for Character and Social Responsibility. Please keep your video and microphones off during the presentation. As you listen, if you have any questions, please include them in the chat box. Um, and now please join me in welcoming Bernice Lerner. Thank you so much, Lior. And thank you to um, the friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center and everyone who joined is joined in this uh, call today. Um, I'm now going to share my screen with you to begin my presentation. <clears throat> So I'm going to tell you um, really a uh, race against time rescue story, the story of how my mom's life was saved. Unfortunately, uh, tragically, the race was lost for far too many people. But I, at one point, became very interested in how um, the actual liberation of Bergen-Belsen took place. Bergen-Belsen being the place that my mom wound up at the end of the war. And um, I, I decided to tell the story ultimately from two vantage points, that of my mom, who was a child survivor, she was 15 at the end of the war, and also through the lens of Brigadier Glenn, uh, Hugh Llewellyn Glenn Hughes, who was the man responsible for uh, rescue and relief efforts at Bergen-Belsen. Um, so here you have, I just wanted to just show you um, these are covers from uh, the same book, but one uh, on the left published in the US, the other on the right published in the UK. Um, the publishers were given the same text, same images, but you can see they came up with very different concepts for the cover. But I wanted to show you because here you can see my mom on um, the background here. And this is about taken about seven months after the wars and her black and blue marks have receded her. She, you could see here that she uh, has had nutrition but you can also see the look in her eyes. She's very depressed, very naturally depressed because if you were orphaned and very deathly ill at the age of 15, it's not a happy moment for you. So you could see the seriousness in her eyes. And here she is, um, the backdrop is correct here. This is an Arvika snowy Northwest Sweden, a tuberculosis sanitarium. And here on the bottom, you can see a close up look of Glenn Hughes. You can see he's startled by the camera. And here's a, a, an image here where you can see more of the background, which is he was in his caravan on the premises, the vicinity of Bergen-Belsen, and he was pretty high up in the hierarchy. So he could have been working on any number of things, trying to corral help from various organizations and medical schools and places. And also here he could be working up diets for people in five stages of emaciation. So um, I just wanted to show you both images. So how did I go about telling this book about two very different uh, protagonists? Well, I decided again to tell it as a race against time and really focusing on the last year of the war, the last very dramatic year from the spring of 1944 to the spring of 1945. So the meat of the book is the four seasons with the fifth season being the convergence of the protagonist in this hell in Northwest Germany, sandwiched in between um, some paragraphs about the Belsen trial, which was very striking, which was the first trial to apply international law to war crimes, immediately preceding the more famous Nuremberg trials. So the Belsen trial began September 17th, 1945. It had to end just in time for the start of the Nuremberg trials. November 17th. And what is really significant to me in writing this book about the Belzen trial is that Glenn Hughes served as the first witness, setting the tone for four trials applying international law. 
And here you can see this Army Talks magazine from November 1945. And uh, it shows the courtroom in a makeshift gymnasium in Lüneburg, uh, a north of um, about 50 miles north of Bergen-Belsen. And here the, you could see the um, 45 Nazi functionaries that are brought to the trial. Number nine, Irma Gracie is, was the kind of an outstanding character because she was 22 and she was hung for a walk. Do you wish to be sharing your screen? Yeah, can you see my, my screen? I'm afraid not. Oh. Oh, is, can anyone else not see it? Because I can see it. Okay, if you're using a phone, you might have to swipe see it. through to see the screen at the end or an all good all good now thank you as well perfect okay, i'm so sorry about that and then um so this is the war from shell you should realize of course that there were 480 nazi functionaries working in bergen belsen and only 45 were brought to trial uh, these 45 were part of the 80 that remained in bergen belsen during the transfer from the um, germans to the british and then the book is further sandwiched between a prologue and an epilogue, where I, I get to, I, where I tell some important things about both Glenn Hughes and my mom in the chapters of their life. So um, this is where Glenn Hughes, where the, that year, spring of 1945, started for Glenn Hughes, and here's where it began for my mom. And I'm just going to, in this presentation, I'm going to tell you about some just moments along the way, um, just um, just some significant facts that both protagonists um, experienced as part of the context of war as they were navigating the, these horrible winds that were blowing them deep into Northwest Germany to Bergen-Belsen. And after, um, after I'm done with this, I will tell you a little bit about um, Bergen-Belsen at the wars after, after the liberation. So my mom starts out in Siget, which is in the um, Carpathian Mountain region, Transylvania. It was formerly Romania when she was growing up. Then uh, Hungary took over, took it over in 1940. Glenn Hughes is in the Yorkshire Wolds, and then going up through D-Day to Bergen-Belsen. So the Yorkshire Wolds were chosen uh, as a place to practice because the topography apparently resembled that of Normandy where the allies were going to be landing on D-Day. And Glenn Hughes was very involved in the planning um, in terms of being at this point, he's director of medical services for the British Army's Eighth Corps, which would go on to see the most ferocious fighting. Um, in, for, from the medical perspective, it, it involved a lot of advanced planning he was very meticulous, um, very careful in um, timing things, how long it would take to set up and take down um, field ambulances, casualty clearing stations. And while improvisation would be the order of the day and evacuating wounded soldiers, um, the, uh, he also really was a great stalwart, stalwart for preparedness. And my mom began her journey in Siget. And very sadly, um, we don't have a single photograph uh, of my mom's parents or her as a child before the war. Um, there was really nothing left, but um, here is Siget on the map and context here is Siget. You can see that it's, it was Northern Transylvania, uh, part of Hungary at the time of the deportation. And I did visit, I did have the opportunity to visit the town before the pandemic and while the town of 30,000 that was 40% Jewish had a real uh, rhythm of Jewish life in it before the war. There was nothing like that now. It's completely changed. Um, Elie Wiesel, when he visited, saw ghosts everywhere. And um, he told his son, who was on the trip I was on, that, um, by the way, Elie Wiesel was from Siget. He said that um, there were two Sigets. There was Siget as it exists today, and Siget Min uh, Shamayim from the heavens, as it was in his memories of growing up there. But as changed as it was, right, the mountains don't move, the um, streets did not move. So I could, even though the streets had different names, I could kind of trace my mom's path as a kid as 
um, some of the places she described to me and I could kind of calculate where she lived. And here at one point she drew a map for me of her street. It was between, it stretched, it was like an alley with a lot of um, homes and sheds and it stretched between Timar Utsa and Kigya Utsa, Snake Street, where um, the families from her neighborhood were lined up to be marched to the synagogue for deportation. And Elie Wiesel's house is about right over here. Um, so I, it was about a four minute walk to my mom's. So now we're skipping, we're skipping to a different point in the timeline. I'm, I'm not going to go through all the, all the um, horrors that um, my mother experienced on her way to Auschwitz, but I will, or, or what, what Glenn Hughes was privy to as he was planning for the D-Day invasion, the most magnificent um, armada of, you know, 150,000 allied soldiers from the U.S., Canadian, and British armies landing on these five beaches on the, on the coast of Normandy, totally taking the Germans by surprise. Um, but I just want to make one point of this, that on June 6th, the day of this incredible invasion, um, there were uh, 4,414 Allied troops killed on this day on June 6th. And on this day, June 6, 1944, my mom was already in Auschwitz for three weeks. And on this very day, um, more than twice the number, more than 9,000 um, Jewish deportees were killed. And so more than twice the number of, of Jewish people from the Hungarian provinces were killed in this last massive, um, murder campaign to uh, that touched the last mass of unmolested Jews in Eastern Europe and taking them to um, Auschwitz and getting the gas chambers and ovens ready for them in Birkenau so that they could dispose of as many human beings as possible in the shortest amount of time. And moreover, while what happened in D-Day was catastrophic, um, for especially for the U.S. Army, where they lost the majority, the Americans lost the majority of men on Omaha Beach. Um, every day after that, as bad as the fighting was in the hedgerows of Normandy, there were fewer, fewer deaths. Whereas in Auschwitz, the same number of people or more were killed every single day for throughout the summer of 1944. And here are. Um, some very valuable photographs that were found in an album. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Auschwitz album taken by an SS officer, presumably to show how efficiently and smooth the process went. But these are very critical photos and it shows here a lot of order and chaos, how the Nazis had the women, men and women separated. But if you really zero in and look closely at what's going on, people are are talking to each other. They're totally confused. They don't know where they've landed. They have no idea what's about to happen to them. There's a woman maybe turning and talking to a child. And any eyewitness testimony from, from this point at, uh, arriving in Auschwitz will, can give a very um, chilling account of what it was like. And here's just some more pictures from that Auschwitz album. And these are women and children being marched and old people being marched, taken to the walking on their way to the gas chambers. It was very near the ramp. And this picture on the lower left, my mother would say, well, these women who were selected to work, right? The Nazis siphoned off a certain percentage of Hungarian to work for the war effort. It was at the stage where manpower or person power was very low and they needed people to man munitions factories and for other jobs. She would say these women were lucky because they had kerchiefs where she didn't have a kerchief. And here is just an image of Canada, the place where people, people's goods were sorted, right? People brought in all kinds of things. They didn't know where they were being taken. And you were lucky if you were picked to work in Canada. There's a lot of stories about that. But basically, it was the name was chosen to name it after a vast country, right, Canada, and it was a vast warehouse where every everything had to be sorted from hairbrushes to to baby prams, every, all kinds of goods, and a lot of jewelry hidden and foodstuffs. So another just snapshot from the other angle, from the Allies' angle, and from the kinds of things that 
Glenn Hughes was concerned with. So I'm just, I just lifted up a couple of pages of images from his archives. Um, so you could just see how, how thoughtful he was. He, he planned out the DJ invasion D plus one, D plus two, D plus three. Um, those are the number of days after D-Day. He landed on D plus six, and here he is estimating the number of Neptune battle casualties, the to total persons ashore, less casualties, the number drowned and battle casualties, wounded as a percentage of casualties, sick, and the total number of wounded and sick. And here's just um, some of the kind of special units he had to bring along and every surgery was planned out to like um, certain surgeries would take 42 minutes and 37 seconds. I mean, everything was very planned out. And here's the type of units that were brought neurosurgical, maxillofacial, and the um, number of beds he, he, in various hospitals, he commandeered along the way. And here's just more from Glenn Hughes's albums, what it's like going into towns and liberating them here in the middle. Um, you can see that there are Germans surrendering to the British soldiers. This is just after they crossed the fortress, the Rhine, and uh, getting deep into Germany. But it was a journey. It was, um, it took, um, well, the uh, lead leaders of the free world, uh, the allies, Churchill, uh, Stalin at that time, Roosevelt predicted the war would end by Christmas of 1945. Things would have looked very different had their predictions came through. But no, it was a slog to get through the defenses, German defenses, and they did not come into Bergen-Belsen until April. So um, I just want to make one little aside point, which was um, Bergen-Belsen was liberated on April 15th, 1945, three weeks before the end of the war. But, but um, oops, I'm sorry. Um, but um, the United Nations chose International Holocaust Remembrance Day as January 27th, 1945, several months earlier, because that it was the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. But Bergen-Belsen was, at the war, war's end, the place that contained the largest number of surviving inmates. By the time the, um, the Russians liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau on January 27th, there were fewer than 8,000 inmates remaining in the three main camps of Auschwitz because the Nazis, knowing that the uh, Russians were at their heels. They, liber they sent the remaining inmates on death marches. They sent about 60,000 Auschwitz inmates on a death march beginning in the middle of January 1945, before the Russians could come liberate. So here you have Auschwitz I, which was the main camp. And um, two miles away, you have Auschwitz II, which was Birkenau, which was where the massive killing took place, four gas chambers and crematoria going round the clock during the Hungarian deportation, and Auschwitz, Auschwitz III, which was about four miles away, which had slave laborers. Buna is synthetic rubber. It's a synthetic rubber factory. So these were the numbers of inmates that were remaining in the three main camps in Auschwitz at the time that the Russians came in. And here were the death marches that either they went northwest or they went directly west, about 30 miles, uh, 35 miles to Upper Silesia here, about 30 miles here. And after the march, um, people were put onto, whoever remained was were put into freight trains and brought deeper and deeper into Germany. So some inmates were deposited in Flossenburg, some were uh, deposited in Buchenwald, some to Dachau. And Bergen-Belsen, which was very far in, away from the liberators, away from the Allied forces, right? No inmate was to fall alive into the hands of the Allies, was deep in Northwest Germany. And by the time the British came in on April 15th, there were 60,000 people there. So um, I'm not going in to go into why, um, why it was handed over. I mean, basically, it was a humanitarian thing, the people in Bergen Belsen were very, very diseased. You had here, remember, you had here, there were people who had managed to evade the gas chambers, 
survived slave labor, survived the death march. And just to give you an idea, there was something like 714,000 um, inmates on the, on the death march in January of 1945. Uh, more than a third of them died along the way. They were, didn't have adequate clothing. It was a bitter cold winter. They had no food. They were exhausted. They didn't have proper footwear. People were just being shot right and left on the road while they were marching by, shot by the Wehrmacht who were guarding them. In any event, about 60,000 make it at the end to um, Bergen-Belsen. Uh, not, not all of the 60,000 were recent arrivals from death marches. Some people had been there for a, a longer. My mom, my mom arrived on a death march a month before, about March 15th, 1945. She had been on a death march and uh, April 12th is when a truce was signed between the German army and the British army. And it's a truth is stranger than fiction story, how this happened, how Himmler decided to turn the camp over against Hitler's orders. Um, but that's what happened. And this man, Glenn Hughes, who, as I mentioned, was a stalwart for preparedness, came into a totally shocking, shocking situation for which he had no idea how to go about trying to save lives and clean up this camp. Um, this is an image, there was a road bisecting the main camp. There were three compounds on one side, two on the other. The men and women were separated. There was not adequate housing for people. There wasn't any, barely any food. The last five days before the camp was handed over, there was no food or water handed out to anyone at all. On April 12th, the day the truth, truce was signed, the Nazis decided to press any inmates who could still walk into service, into work. They had to drag um, skeletal beings um, down this road, bisecting the camp to a mass grave at the end. This was their cleanup effort. It didn't work. They had to be abandoned after a couple of days because too many people were dying on the job. As those uh, who, as my mother described it, she was 50% dead. She had to drag those who were 90% dead. Not some people were still breathing to the mass grave. So um, that was the situation. Um, it was indescribable. I can't describe it. I wasn't there to witness it and people who were there have a hard time explaining what it was like, um, both the liberators and those who survived it. But I'm going to now show you some images. Um, this was one of the most photographed uh, liberations. A lot of times when you see photos of the Holocaust at the end of the war, they, were, they came from this period of time where the British Film and Photographic Unit that came in the same day as the British Second Army to liberate the camp the same day they they were charged with taking photographs, which was made them really, really um, wish never to take photographs ever again. It was a really hard. They understood the historical purpose, but the photographers actually had breakdowns on account of this. So um, here you see that um, there's some displaced persons. They called the surviving inmates displaced persons because they had really no idea where they came from, you know, soon, quickly, uh, Glenn Hughes realized that the vast majority were, were Jewish and they were from all over Europe. They were came from Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland, France. I mean, people were from all over. He, he saw that, and but they, they decided they would call them displaced persons in the meantime. They didn't know about them. And the um, SS who remained in the camp for the transfer were forced to help to bury, bury the, the dead. And here you see British Tommy's soldiers supervising the effort. And here on the bottom, you see Rabbi Leslie Hardman, the Jewish chaplain who came into the camp. And he is bereft at the way people are being thrown helter-skelter into these mass graves. And I talk in my book a little bit about his interactions with Glenn Hughes, but there was reasons this had to be done this way. And these graves were dug out. There was 15 of them about 12 feet deep, 20 to 30 feet wide, 40 to 50 feet long. And it was honestly a lot of guesswork into how many were buried in each of these graves. There were these 
markers at the time erected. This is grave number two, 5,000. If you were to go there today and see, it's a very, they have a very good um, memorial and exhibit. There are beautiful concrete monuments that say the number of people buried in each grave. But again, it was estimates. This image of the camp um, reminded me of something my mom had told me, which I've read a, lots of accounts about, is that this girl here, you can see she has a big square cut out of the back of her coat. And the slave laborers that were uh, working in the munitions factories and other factories received some clothing from that was taken away from the inmates at Auschwitz and all big squares had to cut out of the back of the coats, lest they try to escape, they should be easily identifiable as halfling prisoners. And here you see, if you go there today, this beautiful tombstone for Margot and Anne Frank, but I can promise you this is not the spot where they died or were buried. It was, it's really unknown. So here's some more images of what, from the liberation. And you can see that these women who are scramble to get some potatoes that they could cook uh, are inured to what is in the background. These, some of the survivors, most of them were sick. There was three epidemics raging in the camp. There was tuberculosis, typhus, gastroenteritis, plus every disease known to humankind. But some were in a little bit better shape if they had a more, more recent arrivals. And this is another image. And um, what, what's really, it may not look like much to you, but it's really become very significant to me. I'll show you because the 11th Light Field Ambulance of the British Second Army came the third day after the liberation and they pitched a dump of tentage around the camp. And the reason was that the huts, they called these structures huts. They were so overcrowded and people were, the dead and living were all laying on top of each other that they wanted to be able to get more room in there, be able to get maybe a sip of water if they had could get enough personnel into the hut too. So they said, anyone who could walk, anyone who was at all ambulatory, get out and go stay in these tents. So my mom um, was in that, at that point, able to go into a tent with four other girls. And she, after a few days, she got expelled from the tent, had to crawl back to the hut, uh, which where she was really beaten almost to death by her fellow inmates. So it's, um, there were, the British, you would think, you know, you, you might have this image of what liberation is like and people cheering and it, we're free, we're free, everything is over, but you aren't going to immediately turn things around from any perspective. The SS guards were still shooting at the inmates after the liberation. The inmates were still not behaving like civilized people because they had been treated so poorly. They had been treated like animals. So there were a lot of behind the scenes stories, anecdotes, events, and things that we will never find out about that took place in the days and weeks after the liberation. We do know that before the Nazis left, they sabotaged the water supply. So the British army had to pump, the engineers had to bring, bring in um, pumps and pump water into the camp. We, the British mayors, um, burgermeisters from the surrounding towns were brought in to see what their countrymen had done as were some of the neighbors and, and people in the towns. And then the rescue effort. So the rescue effort, how were they going to? There's 60,000 people, Glenn Hughes estimated very accurately after one day of serving the camp that 25,000 of the 60,000 needed immediately immediate medical attention he knew he was going to be unable to save 13 to 14,000 people. And that is true. He was, it was just such a humanitarian crisis. One thing that was decided pretty early on, um, the British had these evening meetings, was that they were going to go hut by hut and do some sort of triage where they would, a medic would go in and mark the inmates who he 
uh, the displaced persons whom he thought had a chance at, at life with a red cross on their forehead. And then the men from the light field ambulance dressed in these kind of hazmat suits would go in and pick up these people who maybe had a chance at life, take them in what they called contaminated ambulances because they were everyone had typhus to a place they called the human laundry which was a cavalry stables about a mile and a half away where they set up 60 tables and they um they took german nurses from the area right they didn't have any personnel they hardly had people the war was still raging in northwest europe all the medical units were engaged so they had to do the best they can from whoever they wherever place they could so they took these german nurses and put them in charge of these tables where they had to sponge down the inmates that were brought in, factory style, uh, sponged, sprayed with DDT, put in clean blankets and taken in a clean ambulance to a makeshift hospital about a mile and a half away. So just the logistics of it, if you could just think for a minute, like where are they going to get like 14,000 blankets so, or, or 25,000 blankets? So there was, there was, um, order to the madness, but it, it took a while because it was very chaotic. So I'm going to now read some statistics from the bottom here. So there were 14,000 patients in the Glenn Hughes Hospital. This is important because the nobody, people who haven't heard of Glenn Hughes, but he was so compassionate and so had such moral conviction, trying so hard, such intentions to save people that the survivors who were well enough, who, be, who emerged as leaders, decided to name the hospital in the vicinity for him, the Glen Hughes Hospital. There were 14,000 patients in the Glen Hughes Hospital, the largest such facility in Europe or anywhere on May 19th, 1945, one month after the liberation. It took two weeks for the backlog of corpses to be buried. 500 former inmates died each day for a month after the liberation. They could not stem the tide of death. There were only 361 British Army soldiers and medical personnel working in the relief of Bergen-Belsen two days after its liberation. They couldn't, they just, it took a while to get people in. And you see with any human catastrophe, right? All things human take time, even in our present day, even when we, you know, with hurricanes and things we hear about in the United States or other tragedies or that happen elsewhere in the world, it takes time for rescue. 750 to 1,000 sick people were processed each day for over three weeks after the liberation at the Human Laundry, the place for washing and disinfecting survivors. I, based on some things my mom told me from her vague memory, uh, I calculate that she was probably taken to the human laundry on the first or second day after it, it opened. There were 25,000 inmates who were, or displaced persons who were considered fit. And that meant they were able to walk. If they could walk up three steps to a, a truck, they were considered fit. And they were taken, they were still suffering from various stages of emaciation. They were transferred to the formerly Wehrmacht transit and rehabilitation barracks. Um, and that became sort of the start of what would be the displaced persons camp in Bergen-Belsen after the war. I should say that this number was very uh, fungible, permeable, because some of these fit were fall, fell sick and were taken to the hospital, and some people from the hospital recovered and were taken to the transit and rehabilitation barracks. So finally, Finally, you know, May 8th came, Victory in Europe Day came, and Glenn Hughes was not going to celebrate, and he was not going to um, rejoice at the end of the war until the last hut was evacuated, and every, every prisoner, every former prisoner was accounted for in some way. So he, um, they had a, a ceremony finally on the day the last hut was evacuated, May 21st. And they did a symbolic burning down of the hut. And here's Glenn Hughes, who gave the order for the um, flamethrowers to, to throw the um, flame. And you can see that there are both soldiers and uh, DPs who were well enough who came to witness the event. 
Um, this is the largest part of the Glen Hughes Hospital um, after the war. And the burning down of the hut, it's interesting, this little country off the coast of Sri Lanka, Maldives, considered it a very significant event marking the end of World War II. So the fifth, for the 50th anniversary of the war's end, they issued these stamps. And one of them is the inmate, inmates and British troops burn last hut at Belton. And this is the actual photograph. And this is the postage stamp. And you can see that an effigy of Hitler is being burned down as well. So I'm now going to just read to you um, one of the one of the little um, observations of what it was like uh, and when it came to saving these people. So um, uh, a very large quantity of lipstick arrived, right? They were trying to get materials and resources and bedpans and everything from wherever they, they needed. They could, they could. This was not at all what we men wanted. We were screaming for hundreds and thousands of other things, and I don't know who asked for lipstick. I wish so much that I could discover who did it. It was the action of genius, sheer unadulterated brilliance. I believe nothing did more for these internees than the lipstick. Women lay in bed with no sheets and no nighty, but with scarlet red lips. We saw them wandering around but about with nothing but a blanket over their shoulders, but with scarlet red lips. So I leave it to you to think about why the lipstick was so consequential and significant for these women. So now I have um, a few more minutes and I'm going to really go through the next slides pretty quickly. Uh, it's a remarkable story. Uh, the images I'm going to show you are not images in my book. I, in fact, most of the images I've showed you, I have very, di I have different ones in my book. But um, and I don't get into this chapter that much because my it wasn't my mom's experience. She was taken um, to Sweden in July of 1945. After the war, the Swedish government took in about 7,000 of the sickest survivors from Bergen-Belsen in a humanitarian um gesture to try to rehabilitate them to put them back on their feet um it's a long story there everyone who came to sweden has their own story but there were emerged in bergen belsen itself a very vibrant displaced persons community numbering up to twelve thousand people and people were coming from other parts of europe other liberated camps to bergen belsen in the british zone and it what happened there was quite extraordinary in human history because you have to remember that most of the survivors were the young and the strong they were in their 20s and 30s and they still had a life ahead of them and they were looking quickly to rebuild and there were women and men they didn't know necessarily what happened to their spouse or their children or they they knew if they were taken to auschwitz they had an idea but Maybe, maybe a husband survived, maybe a wife somehow made it through the selections at Auschwitz. So there were 420 men and 300 women who had been married and did not know the fates of their spouses. They were given, granted permission to remarry with a caveat um, that, and that if their former spouse showed up, there would be some material provisions for them. But here is a special bergen belsen Ketuba marriage contract, which had to be drawn up by the rabbis, especially for this special circumstances. And again, it was extraordinary what happened in Bergen-Belsen in the displaced persons camp after the liberation. People were coupling up and there were more weddings than practically any other place. People had lost their families and they were looking to build anew, to create. So within a couple of years, the life at the Belsen DP camp started to revolve around the children and the small children and it was quite a testament to the human resilience from the ashes people were trying to rebuild and i have to say that this was really very much a part of glenn hughes's story because even when his tour of duty ended he kept going to the dp camp and he went to some of the weddings he went to the first wedding and he was so moved by what he saw because he knew what these people had been like. He knew what they had gone through. 
and he, he became also a very great champion of the survivors and by extension, the state of Israel. And I, here's just an example of the kind of resourcefulness and creativity of these survivors. Uh, so this woman, she just wanted to get married in a wedding dress. So her husband who worked in the canteen sold some, traded some coffee beans and cigarettes um, to, a, for, to a German to get his parachute from which was fashioned this beautiful wedding dress, which is on exhibit at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And this woman who was known as the Bride of Bells and she, here she is, she married a British soldier. Um, her name is Gina Turgell and her beautiful wedding dress, which he had fashioned out of uh, English parachute material is at the Imperial War Museum. Here's just, <clears throat> this 19 year old girl, she found some German army officers woolen socks and she found a couple of sticks. She unraveled the wool and knit herself the sweater. So there was a concentration camp theater. There was a lot of talent among the survivors where they put on these performances of their recent, you know, uh, describing their recent past experiences of being separated and the audience of 2000 would be bawling. It was very cathartic. <clears throat> the um, ORT, the Organization for Rehabilitation Train and Training came to the camp and taught classes and dental technician school. Here's welders, uh, mechanics, seamstresses, trying to prepare people for life after the camp and for careers. And here there was a Jewish police force in the, in the, to try to maintain order in this uh, camp, displaced persons camp of 12,000. And here's just some, um, this is a birth certificate of someone who gave birth to her second child in the Glen Hughes Hospital. And this is, there were more, 2000, more than 2,000 babies born in the Glen Hughes Hospital, which was a great, a great source of pride for the brigadier. And here's someone in the hospital who did a series of 11 drawings. And this one says, we survived, what now? And there was a newspaper um, put out our voice, still in existence today by Bells and Survivors. You can find it probably on online. Um, now it's a beautiful magazine, but it was called Our Voice and it was published in the nearby town of Sella. And Green Ink was a real novelty. And here you have the Jewish survivors agitating to go to Palestine, open the gates of Palestine for us. And that was a very political thing at the time, which I won't get into very much here, but here you see men from the Jewish brigade in Palestine visiting the DPs and they are so amazed to see a Jew in uniform. And this is Yesel Rosenstaff who emerged as a leader, a, a diminutive man, but great in stature and voice for the Jewish people agitating for them to open British to open the gates to Palestine. And here I'm going to play you now a uh, very brief video of um, um, Tvi Asarya Herman Halfgad, who was a Yugoslavian POW trained as a rabbi, 32 years old in 1945 at the end of the war, finds out about Bergen Belsen, wants to, wants to be of help, goes there, and here he tells his story. <laughs> שמי אפשר טוב לאנשים לעשות, גרים במחלות, הם רוצים לאנשים. כן. 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 Shalisha. <laughs>
If you have any questions, um, you can either unmute yourself or put them in the chat. Um, um, are there any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Permit me to ask a question. Yeah. Hi, my name's Barry Bender. Oh, you have frozen. Barry, if you can hear me, do you mind typing your question? Okay. Um, in the moment while well, he's frozen, um, there's another question in the chat that says, um, was your mother happy to share her story with you? Um, I don't know happy. I think that she was, I think it came about very organically over a very long period of time. And I think, you know, starting from when I was a child and she would tell me about her childhood in Romania and Siget. And then after the war, she had this big post-war chapter before she married and had children. Remember, she was only 15 at the end of the war. So she had 10 years to have her nightmares and be done with that and regain her health. So when she started over in this country, we're married, having children, um, she, was, she, was a, she was very resilient and very whole. So um, when I was a kid, she would tell me stories about Sweden and her childhood. And then when I was old enough, when she sort of must have sensed that I was ready to hear it, she told me about her experiences during the war, how she was, um, how what happened to my grandparents, what she witnessed. I remember, I remember like it was yesterday, the night, I must have been around 14 years old or 15. And I remember the night I was talking to her in the laundry room of our basement and um, she was ironing and she put down the iron and she stepped away from the ironing board and she leaned forward and she stretched her arms out before her and she demonstrated for me how she dragged by the ankles these skeletal bodies in Bergen Belsen and she was half dead. So she, so happy, I don't know. She, she, so at that time, I don't think she was happy. She, she said to me after, I don't wanna give you nightmares. I don't want you to have nightmares. And, um, but she would still tell me and the thing was that she never made it difficult for me to ask questions. She didn't break down crying. She was, 
always answered everything I wanted to know. Um, so that was really helpful. And then when I was writing the book much, much later in my life and her life, I was very lucky to still have her with me while I was writing the book. I would send her an email and I would ask her to, you know, remember a certain theme details because, you know, I thought it would be helpful to include certain details in a chapter. Like I might say, I hate to bring you back to this moment in time, but when you were on the death march, do you recall what you were wearing? So she would answer me in full and that was really helpful. It was really, it was really, we had a very wonderful relationship. Um, there's another question here in the chat that says, um, was it difficult for the DPs to be parents after suffering with so much in the camps to bond with their children and be in touch with their emotions? Um, and Caroline also asks, how is it for you being the child of a survivor and how do you view people in the world? Okay. So, um, <laughs> so one question, the first question was about parenting after yeah. that kind of thing. So, um, both my parents were survivors. Um, I think my father might have been diagnosed if he was ever diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder because he he was always very worried about me. Like if there was something on the news, the six o'clock news, he was like, these bad things can really happen in this world. So you, when I was in high school, so you need to stay home and read a book. Like you can't go out with your friends. So he was, so that was a challenge when I was an adolescent. But I think that my mom was just, um, like I said, she had she had come to her own philosophy of life and she was just basically a very positive person. So she was a very wonderful buffer. And my father and her were both just very kind and very loving. And by a great miracle, a really great miracle, my father, five of my father's siblings survived, just one of my mother's siblings. She lost four younger brothers and sisters, a brother and three sisters. But my father survived he found out after the war one by one that this sister survived, this sister survived, this brother survived. So I had aunts, uncles, and cousins who were survivors. And so we had, I had some family, which was, which was nice. Um, yeah. Um, and then the second question was, remind me. It says, how is it for you being the child of a survivor? Or oh, a survivor. So all the adults I, I grew up knowing, right, right. My close family members were all survivors and it was, um, a revelation to me, like when I was like 19 or 20, when there were children of survivors groups forming in New York City, where I went to graduate school. So I, I went to them. It was always very interesting. It is uh, being a child of survivors. Um, it could be, it, it could be hard because like I couldn't have written this book when I was in my 40s or 30s or 40s and I had young children myself imagining just what my grand grandmothers went through. Uh, the children, the parents aren't able to protect their children. This is horrifying and just the most, hor most horrible thing I could imagine. So it's, there's sadness and um, great sadness, but there's, um, it's also kind of a privilege and a little bit of a responsibility I felt because I felt if I was able to write and talk about it, I, I should. Um, and I feel you, I think as a daughter of survivors, you're very sensitive to other people's plights, um, to genocide in other places of the world and thinking about what, what people are going through and even like the war in Ukraine it feels very much more immediate and close. And also you realize that for most people, when they read these newspapers, they close the newspaper and they go and they forget about it because it's happening far away. But you can really sort of identify with the people and what they're going through and think about it and realize how important leaders are and how important living, I, I live in the United States and um, I think my parents had such great appreciation for the United States living in freedom. It was like a paradise for them. So uh, lately things were going on that were very upsetting to my mom. Uh, she, she died a little bit over a month ago, but I think that during the period when I was growing up, it was really a wonderful thing for my parents to be in this country. So when people diss the United States, so they have a lot of problems with it. 
I think when you come from a family of survivors, you realize how great it is. As my father would say, if you, he was a slave laborer, you work hard, you work hard, you have, can have something to show for it. And they were frugal and masters at saving. They had a lot of very fine qualities and there were, they were very beloved by their community. So it was really, I had really wonderful parents and they made my, they made my childhood really, really wonderful. And they did not, they did not have nightmares where they were screaming in the middle of the night and they didn't, they didn't burden me. They let me be a child and we had a lot of fun. So that's my story. I know everyone's story can be a little bit different. Um, we have time for just one more question here in the chat. And um, it says in today's age with the spike of anti-Semitism, um, like you see on the internet with Kanye West, um, what do you consider to be the most effective methods in combating anti-Semitism? Oh, well, there is oh, there is several organizations that are working on it. There are people who are more expert than I am. I think education is really important. I am very heartened that um, the Holocaust education is mandated in a lot of schools. It's not always effective. It's not always, nor are museums always effective, but we do, you do reach some people. Um, my mother spoke a lot before she died to school groups. Um, I think everyone has to speak out. If, if you see an injustice, if you see any group that's being bullied or any anyone, even a, a small kid in school, if you see someone being bullied or mistreated, you have to speak up, you have to speak out. And I think we just have to train, train young people to do this. I'm, I'm a big believer in character and ethics education. So I would like to see more of that happening in schools everywhere. And to call it out, I'm really glad that Kanye West was called out by some celebrities and that Adidas did the right thing. And those things have to be applauded and people have to stop and think about it. Unfortunately, people like that have that kind of uh, charisma and power have a lot of followers and it's very scary. Thank you. So um, I think that um, is it in terms of the questions. Um, I wanna, I'll put my video back on. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for your um, very moving presentation. Um, the link to buy Bernice's book is in the chat and it will also be um, sent out afterwards, um, as well as the uh, link to the presentation if you would like to share it. Um, once again, on behalf of Francis Simon Wiesenthal Center, thank you so much um, for coming and speaking with us this afternoon um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone who has stayed, who joined in. Thank you, Lior. Thank you. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.